Okay, so members of the jury, I am going to sustain uh, the objection uh, that was just made by the defense. Uh, we'll strike the answer from the record, and I ask that you disregard the last answer that you heard from uh, the witness. Go ahead. So talk to us about this slide and what you mean by working backwards from known points. So in crash reconstruction, um, we have to work from known points. And in this case, we don't know where the Toyota was at 4.8 seconds before the crash was or any other time for that matter. So we have to work from points that where we know that the vehicle was. And we know that at time zero, it was at the area of impact. So um, it's kind of counterintuitive in the whole crash reconstruction field, but we typically work backwards in time, if that makes any sense. So we have our, our zero point, and we need to figure out where the Toyota was at three tenths of a second before impact. We need to figure out where it was, so that becomes another known point. Then we work back another a, a half a second, so at 0.8 seconds, then that becomes a known point. Then we work back another half a second to 1.3 seconds, and so on and so forth until we get back to uh, 4.8 seconds. Actually, could you go back to that last? Um, so one of the, the tools that we use is a vector. And I don't want anybody's eyes to glaze over or whatever, but just think of a vector as a quantity that possesses both direction and magnitude. In this case, the direction is going to come from the steering tire angle and the distance or the magnitude is going to come from the distance the vehicle traveled during each sampling period. So the distance that the 34.44 feet that it traveled from minus 0.3 seconds to zero. The next amount of feet with the direction again provided by the steering tire angle. Okay. What is this? So this is a diagram that I created with Faro HD diagramming software and it depicts uh, a little over 600 feet of I-89 southbound. Um, if you remember back probably 15 slides ago, we, I calculated the distance from impact to 4.8 seconds, those are like 601 feet. So that's, that's that distance there. It encompasses about a little over 600 feet. So what, um, it's really kind of hard to see because it's, it's like too small a format um, for us to kind of print out. But each one of those um, dark sort of information blocks on the right-hand side, that's a sampling period. So the first one is time zero, then 0.3 seconds, um, 0.8, uh, 1.3, 1.8. 2.3, 2.8, 3.3, 3.8, 4.3, down to 4.8. And if you look, there's a, um, again, on the diagram, is a little vehicle at each one of those points. Could you use your pointer? Oh, sure. So here are the, I'm sorry, so, so these, these are the, the things that I just kind of rattled off, the, the dark things on the side. And then, like, here is the vehicle at 4.8 seconds. Here's the vehicle at um, 4.3 seconds, 3.8, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say the word vector, but just once, it is what is in between these. It's the, the line that's in between each of those vehicles at each sampling period. And where, and is, where is the center line? That is the dark dashed line here. Okay, now, please be kind with us. Please <laughs> and try and explain what a yaw is. 
Okay. Um, so this particular Toyota Tacoma, this particular vehicle, provides us with yaw rate data. Um, if anybody has, well, hopefully we're all from Vermont and have driven in the snow, um, if you're driving down the road and it's snowy or icy and you turn the wheel, we've probably all felt the rear end kick out. Technically the rear end is kicking out, but what's happening is the vehicle is rotating about its vertical center of mass. So if this was a car and I drew, if I drilled a hole down through it, it would rotate around its vertical center of mass like this. Okay? So that's that's what yaw rate is. It's it's the the sort of direction of the vehicle heading about its about rotating about its uh, vertical center of mass. And, and why is that important in your calculations? Um, if you remember, um, I don't remember which sampling period it was. Um, so here we have a steering wheel angle of minus 75 degrees. So the wheel is, is cranked pretty far to the right at a, a reported speed of 75.8 miles an hour. Recall that the actual speed is about a little more than 3% greater than that, so I think it's actually 78.3 or something like that. Think about if you're driving down the highway at 65 miles an hour, if you turn the wheel 75 degrees, things are not going to go well. Okay? Your vehicle is going to start to yaw about its um, vertical center of mass. So that, that's what's gonna happen. Um, if, obviously we, we've all kind of done it in snowstorms or, or whatever, the coefficient of friction is reduced so you don't have to be going really fast for that to happen. But if you're doing almost 80 miles an hour and you turn the steering wheel 75 degrees, it's gonna start to rotate. That's what we're talking about here. So in a yaw, here we have a vehicle going straight down the road. Its heading, or where the headlights are pointing, is in line with its bearing, the yellow line. Um, and here we have a vehicle that's in yaw. So where these lines cross is kind of where the center of mass is. So um, this would be indicative of somebody steering hard to the left. So the rear end's gonna kinda kick out to the right and it's gonna rotate around its, its center of mass or its vertical center of mass. Um, so when a vehicle's in yaw, it's heading or where the headlights are pointing is not in line with the direction that it's traveling, okay? So if I'm traveling north and I yank the wheel hard to the left and I'm going pretty fast, my car is going to be going this way but I'm going to keep traveling this way, okay? It, it, depending on, on the, um, how grippy the road is, if you will, you know, the, 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 um, the bearing may change slightly, but the car is still going to go into yaw. Um, because the vehicle's traveling at speeds of 81, 83, 85, 86, 88, 89, 86, 83, 78, and we're talking about steering wheel angles of 15 degrees, 36 degrees, 51 degrees, 54, 75, 51. Um, you know, if, if you're driving down the highway, Let's say I was driving up to Burlington this morning at 70 miles an hour. I am not turning my steel steering wheel very much, so 75 degrees is a lot, even at 70 miles an hour. So here we have our yaw rate, and the yaw rate is uh, provided in degrees per second. 
Remember back when I first started talking, we talked about speed in miles per hour, and we converted that into velocity, which is in feet per second. And then remember that um, we're not dealing with full seconds up here, so we have to calculate how much yaw. If the vehicle is yawing at 11, minus 11.22 degrees per second, is it yawing a full 11.22 degrees in three tenths of a second? The answer is no. We have to multiply that per second yaw rate by the time period. But again, just like with the speeds, this is um, a snapshot of all of the data that's collected at each sampling period. So to get a more accurate representation of what's, what the vehicle is doing, we take the average between each sampling period. So the average, be, oh. I'm sorry. So the average between minus 15.62 and minus 11.22 would be 13.42. So I kind of jumped ahead of myself. I apologize. <laughs> That's probably why I lost you guys. Um, <laughs> um, so again. Uh, Yaw rates reported in degrees per second. We're not dealing in full seconds up here on the top. We're dealing in fractions of seconds or, or tenths of seconds, you know, three tenths here, and then half a second, five tenths there. So we're just multiplying the average yaw rate by the time sampling period to get the approximate yaw that the vehicle experienced. So for the first three sampling periods, so minus 4.8, minus 4.3, minus 3.8, we don't have any yaw. There's no reported yaw, so the total yaw is zero. So that means that the heading is in line with the bearing. We're driving straight, straight down the road. Everything's good. Okay, just so I understand, this is confirmation about previous calculations and determinations you made about what that vehicle was doing in those That's correct, seconds. yes. So from 3.3 to 1.8 seconds, we have a positive yaw rate listed there. If we go back to that data element sign convention, remember we looked at steering input and we said, okay, a positive sign indicates a left turn. It's the same thing for yaw. So if we see a positive yaw rate value, which we do here, that means it's yawing, it would be a counterclockwise manner. So left turn, so left turn. Yep. Again, confirmation. Yep. From 1.3 to zero seconds, we have a negative yaw rate. And again, positive sign from our data elements uh, sign convention. So a positive means a left turn, then a negative must mean a right turn. Okay? Um, and what I did here, if you can go back to the previous slide, please. So I took these values and summed them. So we have, if you add these all up, it comes out to 4.15 degrees. If you go forward, please. If we sum these, it's minus 15.01 degrees over those uh, four sampling periods. So what's done here is um, the, uh, this, the green vehicle is the Toyota. Sorry, I didn't use a better color green in the diagram. But what, if I can stop you, what was the actual color of the Toyota? I still think it's green, but, <laughs> but not, not bright green. It's definitely like a greenish grayish sort of color. Okay. But maybe that's just my eyes. So when I produced this diagram, this vehicle would actually have been at a heading of 87.05 degrees. Remember in the previous slide, we added up 
the negative headings or the, the negative yaw rate and it came out to 15.01 degrees. If we subtract 15 from 87, we get 72. That vehicle is, is aligned at 72 degrees on the diagram. And so it says vehicle 2 at impact based upon undercarriage marks on pavement? Yes, you can see these marks right here. Um, what I tried to do in this diagram is I changed the opacity or the sort of see-throughness of the Jetta. So you can kind of see the left front tire there, you can kind of see the, the right front tire there. Those blue marks are from the gouge mark that I determined was created by the inside of the right front tire rim. I think you saw pictures of that yesterday with Sergeant Ballinger. So, the, oh, I'm sorry, is the center line anywhere on there? Yes, it's that black line that you can kind of see through the, um, the Jetta. So this is a picture of the front of the Toyota, uh, the night of the crash. Um, I didn't take the picture, but um, looking at looking at it um, this right here is the left front bumper mount this right here is the right front bumper mount on cars that we see today if you think back to cars from the 70s they used to have metal bumpers now they still have metal bumpers but they're hidden behind typically either a rubber or a fiberglass bumper cover so there should be a, an aluminum or some sort of metal thing, um, a, a bumper, attached to the right front bumper mount and the left front bumper mount, but obviously that's missing. Um, also, as you can see, they've both been pushed to the passenger side of the truck. And what is the significance of that? You if you go back one slide. So you can see the car is traveling south. It's going to push everything in that direction. Are you finished with this? Yes. So now tell us about this. So when I aligned the vehicles at maximum engagement and then sort of scrolled my, my, uh, my diagram out, this is what I saw basically without without the big red arrow i put that in there because i said wow the car ends up in its final position of rest over here and that's documented by sergeant ballinger and the folks that that worked the scene the night of the crash we know that this is the area of impact and that's pretty much the the path of travel of the jetta right there and, and what is the significance of, of this to you um, the Toyota Tacoma certainly impacted and had an effect on the Jetta. So this is more information from the big chart that you saw with Sergeant Ballinger yesterday. Uh, among the other data that's provided, up, up here we have our time in seconds. Here we have our vehicle speed. Down here we have our accelerator pedal percentage. And for 4.8 to 2.8, it's at 100%. What, so 100% accelerator pedal, what does that mean? Um, in layman's terms, uh, his foot is to the floor. It's, you can't get any more acceleration out of this vehicle. It's 100%. So then at 2.3 to 1.8, it's down to 44%, 33%. And then from minus 1.3 to zero, it's at 0%. And related to that, think about this is an automatic transmission vehicle. Down here we have from 4.8, so the, the service brake. All that is is a switch that's located on the sort of the underside of your dashboard 
and that tells the brake lights to come on. Um, and from 4.8 seconds to 1.8 seconds, it's off. But from one, minus 1 1.3 to zero, it indicates that the service brakes are on. So typically, most of us who have driven an automatic vehicle, or an a vehicle with an automatic transmission, we drive with one foot. You shouldn't be driving with, with both feet. But um, So if you take your foot off the gas to put it on the brake, you're probably going to have zero acceleration, you know, uh, uh, zero accelerator percentage if your foot is on the brake. Um, also, the, the next line down is the brake oil pressure. And um, what does that mean? It's sort of like how we had the accelerator pedal percentage. You know, we had 100%, and then we had 44%, and then 33%, and then zero. It just kind of tells us how much the brake is on, or how, how much the accelerator is on. This does the same thing, but in our data limitations in the report, it says the brake oil pressure has an upper limit of 12.14, I think that's millipascals. I don't know what that is, but it's... Somehow they measure brake pressure using that that um, uh, I, can't, I can't think of the the name right now, but that, that that's how they measure the brake pressure. So uh, as we can see, the brakes were off, off, off. Here they're on. 3.55. If we divided. Uh, 3.55 by 1 or 12.14, which is the maximum pressure it would give us a percentage. So we could we could document what the percentage of the brake pressure um, is for each sampling period. But obviously 3.55, roughly 25, 30 percent. Of, of the brake pressure, pressure being put on the brake? Correct. Okay. Here that would be a little bit less than that. Here we're getting up kind of high because we're approaching the maximum number of 12.14 and here we're at 12.14. So that's 100% braking. Now you told us before that uh, you were able to determine uh, the speed the Jetta was going at impact. Did I have that correct? Yes. Okay. And is, are these next couple of charts going to about that? Yes. All right, so please go ahead. So this is um, a form that I use to do what we call a vector sum analysis. And I'll try to very simply explain that. The Using momentum, the momentum coming into a crash, the momentum that, that the two vehicles bring into the crash, equals the momentum going out of the crash. So if they crash and then go off in this direction, the momentum from impact to final rest is the same as the momentum when they come in to, to maximum engagement. So using my scale diagram, I calculated a post-impact speed for the Volkswagen Jetta and for an approximate post-impact speed for the Toyota Tacoma. And in this case, P3 refers to the Toyota Tacoma, and P4 um, corresponds to the Volkswagen Jetta. So the weight of the Toyota Tacoma was approximately 4,385 pounds. The approximate weight of the Jetta was 3,638 pounds. And I calculated a post-impact speed for the Tacoma of about 23.7 miles an hour and a post-impact speed of 38.73 miles per hour. Without going into a long, drawn-out discussion or explanation that will have you thoroughly confused, I calculated that the Jetta would have been going approximately 32.99 miles per hour at impact and the Toyota was traveling at 78.4 miles per hour at impact. And what is the significance of knowing what speed the Jetta was at at impact? 
Well, it, that tells me that they saw something that concerned them and were slowing down. So this, this is basically that sort of a blown up area of, of that chart. So the Jetta impact speed, 32.99 miles per hour. The Toyota Tacoma impact speed, 78.4. Um, one of the things that we got from the Toyota, from the report that Sergeant Ballinger gave me, was the change in velocity. And it was 54.81 miles per hour. That's basically, I think, within about a hundredth of a mile an hour, what I calculated using vector sum analysis. So my, my calculations using vector sum analysis match with the EDR data from the Toyota Tacoma. Um, then what I did was a statistical analysis. I did a Monte Carlo analysis for um, basically what I did with the, the vector sum analysis but I did it um, setting up ranges, like I ranged the weights for both vehicles, ranged the post impact speeds, plus or minus a mile an hour for each vehicle. Um, I ranged the uh, approach angle and departure angles for both vehicles, a degree uh, on either side. And for the Jetta, I calculated an impact speed of 33.0, or I'm sorry, an average impact speed of 33.01 miles per hour. If you remember the um, speed that I calculated using vector sum analysis was, was 32.99, so I was two hundredths of a mile an hour off. Um, speed for the Tacoma calculated using momentum in a Monte Carlo analysis. The average speed was 78.41. The calculated speed from the EDR data was 78.4 miles per hour. So then, um, something that I had learned recently is using trigonometry to help solve um, for specifically a situation like this where we have EDR data from one vehicle but we don't have EDR data from another vehicle. To make a sort of a long story short and not confuse you, we can use the science of or the mathematics of triangles to solve for unknowns. And in this case, I wanted to solve, I knew what the impact speed for the Toyota Tacoma was. I knew that the delta V was, or the change in velocity, was 54.8 miles an hour, but I wanted to check myself to make sure that I had calculated the, the post-impact speed correctly, and I came up with 23.7 miles an hour, which is what I had calculated using a slide to stop following the uh, initial impact. I did the same thing with the um, Jetta, again, using the EDR data and some trigonometry and the law of cosines, I determined that the impact speed was 32.99 miles per hour, which is exactly what I had calculated using vector sum analysis. So, just to sum that up, you used a number of different methods to arrive at basically the same number of the Jetta, the, the speed of the Jetta. That's correct. When, when I'm solving for speeds, I'd like to solve solve it um, and in as many different ways as I can and have um, you know w with with the hope that the the different methods corroborate each other and in this case they do within within a couple hundredths of a mile an hour. So in this case, the, um, um, using the vector sum analysis, I calculated a change in velocity for the Jetta of 66.0602 miles per hour. When I used the, um, um, the EDR data, 
I came up with 66.05 miles an hour, so I was a hundredth of a mile an hour off. When I calculated the change in velocity for uh, the Toyota Tacoma using vector sum analysis, I came up with 54.8066. This is the reported change in velocity from the EDR report from the Toyota Tacoma, 54.8. So they match. So um, does this tell us the speed of the Jetta after impact? Um, well, sort of. So the impact speed is around 32 or 33 miles per hour. It, ex it, it experienced a change in velocity of 66.06 .06 miles per hour, which is a lot. So it went from 33 to 66 after impact, is that what you're saying? No, um, the post-impact speed that I calculated was about 38 miles per hour, but there's some trigonometry involved in angles. So I can't say, you know, let's just, you know, add numbers. So there's some trigonometry involved, but I believe the post-impact speed that I came up with was around 38 miles per hour, but that was in a different direction if that makes sense. So if they're going 32.99 miles an hour this way and then they get redirected at 38 miles an hour this way. Okay. Your Honor, this is a good stopping point. Okay, so um, uh, we're going to take our morning break. You've obviously heard a lot, so I'm just going to continue to ask you to have a great break, but please do not discuss the testimony uh, that you've heard uh, with each other. So I'll stand in recess. Thank you.